First Meeting, Sunday, June 9th, 1974 Questions and Answers First Question, Woman 1 In establishing mindfulness of breathing, should we fix our attention at the nose or in the stomach region? Answer In establishing mindfulness of breathing, you should fix your mindfulness on and contemplate the point of contact of the breath. You should not go up and down with it, but keep the chitta fixed on the point of contact. If the breath seems to become fainter and fainter, it is nothing to be afraid of or to worry about. The breath has not ceased. It is still there. The kind of meditation which a person practices depends on the character of each individual practitioner, but the development of mindfulness of breathing is a practice suitable for the majority of people. The important factor in any method of mind development is mindfulness or sati. Forgetting mindfulness means failing in your task and you will not get good results. You should therefore take care of your mindfulness and keep it present when using any method of mind development. Second question, woman one. When sitting in meditation, why is it I get the feeling that there is something pulling my forehead backwards? The muscles in my forehead become tight and I get a headache. Is there any way to remedy this? Answer. You will have to lessen the intenseness which brings this about. Let the jitta be absorbed only in the breathing. If you are too intense, you will get a headache. The flow of the jitta is very important. You can concentrate strongly or mildly, and what you concentrate on will give you results, much or little accordingly. Third question, man one. My being a Buddhist has caused my friends to talk about me. They say that at one time I used to be a person full of fun and high spirits, and that now I am the exact opposite. I have lost a lot of friends, and even my wife misunderstands me and disagrees with me. How can I solve this problem? Answer. Being a Buddhist does not mean that you must be quiet or look solemn. If friends try to get you to go in a way which is unwholesome and you are observing the moral precepts, the sila, you should not follow them. You might lose your friends, but you will not lose yourself. If you are satisfied that you have gone the way of wholesomeness, you should consider the Buddha as an example. He was a prince who had a large retinue and many friends. He renounced the world, gave up those friends, and went to dwell alone for many years. After he had attained enlightenment, he was surrounded by friends and had many disciples who were arahants, pure ones, monks as well as nuns, laymen and laywomen, until the number of Buddhists was more than the population of the world. We all believe in the teachings of the Buddha which unites the hearts and minds of all Buddhists. We therefore should not be afraid of having no friends. We should think, first of all, that our friends do not yet understand us, and so they drift away and no longer associate with us. Our way of practice in the way of wholesomeness still remains, however. We should see that there are still good people in the world. Good people eventually meet and become friends with other good people, and these good people will be our friends. If there are no good people in the world, and if there is nobody interested in associating with us, then we should associate with the Tamma, with Buddha, Tammo, and Sankho in our hearts, which is better than friends who are not interested in goodness at all. Buddha, Tammo, and Sankho are friends which are truly excellent. Ordinarily, those good friends of yours will come back to you. You should therefore rest assured that if your heart is satisfied that you are going in a wholesome direction, then that is enough. You should not be concerned with or worry about others more than yourself. You should be responsible for yourself in the present and in the future, for there is nobody but yourself who can raise you up to a higher level. Fourth question, woman one. I also have that same experience. My mother knows that I have become a Buddhist and she is so upset that she prays to God for my return to Christianity once again. She is very concerned about me. How should I help her? Answer. My mother was also worried about my coming to England. She was afraid that I might die or that something serious might happen. But I saw that there were good reasons for coming, to which she could hardly object, so even though she did not want me to come, she had to accept those reasons, and I came. Please understand that Buddhism does not teach people to draw away from each other. Buddhism and Christianity both teach people to be good so that they will be happy and go to heaven. 
If we compare the city of London to heaven, we could tell people that there are many ways to enter the city. When they have chosen a way and made use of it, all of them will reach London. Whatever religion they have, they should practice it accordingly. Then they will meet in heaven. Buddhism, however, besides having a way to reach heaven, also has the way to reach Nibbana. If one understands and practices according to the teachings and wants to reach Nibbana, there are ways for going beyond. Nibbana means the complete absence of dukkha, unsatisfactoriness, suffering, dis-ease. The Buddha and his Arahant disciples, being completely free from all defilements, kilesas, have all attained Nibbana. They therefore should not be worried about anyone who follows them. You should explain this to your mother so that she will not worry about you, for what Buddhism teaches will be for the stability and prosperity of society. It encourages people to be good, so tell your mother not to worry, that Buddhism is not hell, and that it does not bring disaster or ruin to those who practice its teachings. Fifth question, Woman 1. My husband is the same. He does not understand what it is that I am doing, and he is not at all satisfied with me. It took me twenty years of asking him to let me sit in meditation before he would allow me to do so. I've been sitting in meditation for five years now. My husband does not understand about spiritual needs, and so whenever I meet someone whose interest is the same as mine, someone to turn to and be friends with, my husband becomes suspicious. Answer when your husband saw that what you were doing was good, that you were not doing anything which was wrong, he consented of his own accord. This is what usually happens in the practice of virtue, which is a difficult thing to do. Even in our own heart we hesitate to do good things. When we think of doing something good, another thought arises to prevent us from doing it. Such conflicting thoughts are bound to struggle with each other before we can turn to the way of virtue. Other people interfering with us is a normal obstacle, but people cannot vie with us in the hindrances we make for ourselves. This is probably the case with everyone. When we want to do something good which is useful, a state of mind is liable to arise as a hindrance, thus preventing it, so we then waste a lot of time. Beyond that, it can lead us to do evil things which are really quite harmful. Sixth question, Woman 2. If we know that something is not good, we can restrain ourselves, keeping ourselves from doing it. Or if the desire to do something is so strong that we will end up doing it anyway, we can go ahead and do it until we get the bad results, then we will dread it. For example, we know that we'll get a stomach ache from eating too many sweets. We can go ahead and eat until we get the stomach ache, then we will automatically stop. Which one of these two methods is better? Answer. Knowing what is not good, training the heart and restraining yourself by not allowing yourself to do something bad is better, because no harm is done. If you make use of the method of giving free rein to the heart, of indulging in your desires until you experience their bad results and then stop by yourself, how do you know that you won't die before you can bring yourself around? And it is just possible that you will not know the way to get back. This can lead to the ruin of your life. Seventh question, man two. I use the method of being aware of the rising and falling of the stomach region, and it seems as if there is something rubbing my stomach. What is this? Answer. Are you satisfied with that sensation or not? When you practice meditation and the jitta is quiet and cool, this is good. Then you get the feeling that there is something hard rubbing your stomach. But when the jitta is quiet, you are satisfied. This is what matters. When you get a feeling that there is something rubbing against your stomach, you should understand that this is only a state of mind manifesting itself, that there is nothing real or useful to the jitta in it. You should then make the jitta be aware of the rising and falling. Do not let the mind dwell on the sensation of rubbing. That sensation will subside and pass away by itself. Eighth question, Woman 3. When I sit in meditation and my mind is close to being one-pointed, close to being calm, it usually withdraws from this state. It goes in and out, in and out, as if it was about to go through a door, but then will not go through. How can I correct this? Answer. When sitting in meditation, are you not aware of the breath going in and out? 
If you are, and you follow the breath in and out, this will happen. You should fix your mind only on the place where there is contact with the moving air. You will then feel the breath become fainter and fainter until it ceases altogether. The chitta will then enter the state of tranquility, samatha, and it will not go in and out, in and out, as you said. Ninth question, woman one. In meditation practice, is it better to sit alone or to sit in a group? I and four friends study meditation with a Chao Kun at Wat Buddha Badipa, who has since disrobed. When I sit by myself, I feel that it is good, but when I sit with my four friends, I feel anxious, and then my practice is not very good. My friends are beginners. Can we help each other or not? Answer. You've sat in meditation in a group before. How do you feel about it? Are you satisfied or not? If you feel that you are giving strength to each other, that is good. Even if you yourself feel anxious, yet your friends may gain strength from you to meditate, that again is good. Bhikkhus usually sit in meditation by themselves, except when they go to listen to the instruction from their teacher. Apart from that, each does his own practice without worrying about anyone else. The citta can become relaxed and peaceful more quickly than sitting in a group, because there is nothing to disturb it or to make it anxious. Tenth question. Woman 1. When my meditation is good, there seems to be some kind of thread extending about one foot out of my body. Then something seems to come and strike it. This is very painful. Answer. How is it now? Is it still there or not? Woman 1. It does not happen any more now, because I felt that pain to be dukkha. I was patient and countered it, then it went away by itself. Answer. That feeling is an emotional production, aramana, of the jitta. Sitting in meditation does not cause it to arise. It is the jitta itself which causes it to arise. If you bring the jitta back to the heart base in the chest and firmly hold it there, such a feeling will go away by itself. Eleventh question, woman one. Sometimes it seems as though my jitta goes out to my friend, or my friend's jitta comes to me. Answer. That is sending the jitta outside of oneself, which is not good for a person who has just begun meditation practice. Only those who are skilled at practice can send their jitta inside and outside without difficulty, because they already know the way to practice. Venerable Banyawarto. When at first we sat down here, Dana Jan Mahabua explained that in practicing mindfulness of breathing, one should contemplate the in-breath and the out-breath until the breath is very fine. One keeps the jitta firmly fixed at the point of contact until there seems to be no more breathing. The jitta will then be peaceful. There is no need to be afraid of the breath stopping. It will still be there. When the breath has become fine, the jitta will feel cool, peaceful. Sometimes, as far as one can tell, breathing seems to have ceased altogether, and the jitta is then very subtle. Woman 1. Please express our appreciation to Ajahn Mahabua for his kindness in coming to talk to us. We are very pleased indeed. Dan Ajahn Mahabua. Buddhism is derived from practice, because the Buddha himself practiced until he himself knew and saw, and was able to do it for himself, and only then did he begin to teach others. Buddhists therefore understand the importance of practicing and training themselves according to the teachings. Learning for the purpose of gaining knowledge and understanding, but without putting it into regular practice, will not bring results as it ought to. One should therefore study and practice moral precepts, sila, until it becomes higher morality, atisila, study all the different levels of wisdom, banya, until one reaches the level of higher wisdom, atipanya, and study freedom, vimutti. One must then practice until one truly reaches freedom, until one has truly escaped from samsara. Practice is therefore the most important part of Buddhism. When someone who practices has reached any particular state of development, he will know this for himself. For example, if he practices the development of mindfulness of breathing, he will know what the state of his breath is, and he will know to what extent the jitta is quiet, still, and peaceful. But he must have mindfulness, and he must not let the jitta wander outside. 
for someone who is beginning to practice, the most important thing is the jitta and mindfulness. The jitta will improve if mindfulness is there to control it, and it will then be peaceful, cheerful, bright, and happiness will come by itself. But if the jitta is not controlled by mindfulness, and if it is allowed free reign so that any and all thoughts can insert themselves, the jitta will not be peaceful and happiness will not arise. Therefore, the most important rule is to not let the imagination give rise to emotionally charged thoughts. Train the jitta to be truly peaceful, then happiness will follow in the wake of the calm which gradually develops. A high degree of calm means a high degree of happiness, until it reaches an extraordinary happiness which comes from the more subtle levels of concentration. For myself, I feel that today is a fortunate occasion in that I have been able to meet you English Buddhists. I'm sorry that I can't speak to you in English and must depend on Venerable Banya Wertho to help translate for me. On this auspicious occasion, let us all sit in meditation together, each practicing according to his ability. Some of you can perhaps sit for a long time, and some of you may tire quickly. Let each of you decide for how long you can sit before you get bodily discomfort and pain arising so that you gradually withdraw from samadhi. You should, however, try to put up with the pain and discomfort for a while because you really want happiness of heart. You have already experienced and known enough about other kinds of happiness, and you have no doubts about them, enough not to be attracted to them. When I was able to sit in meditation for twelve or thirteen hours, and it became painful, I contemplated the place where the pain was and asked, What is it that's painful? A finger? A bone? If they are painful, why are they not painful after one is dead? Why is it that they are painful now? If the jitta is where the pain is, then if one does not have a body, does that mean that the jitta dies too or not? And so on until I reach the truth. Such a tamma. But if you are going to contemplate painful feeling, you must be brave enough to find the truth. Your desire to know the truth must be stronger than the pain and death. Mindfulness and wisdom must be continually traversing throughout your mind and body like a wheel which is turning. Then you can know. Twelfth question. Man 2. What is the benefit of sitting in samadhi for a long time? Answer. Merely sitting for a long time is not good. You must get good results from your sitting. Then, being engrossed in contemplation, a long time will pass by itself. The final result will be that you become happy and free from pain, and that is good. If you arouse wisdom, when it has arisen, the jitta will be bright and cheerful, so it will gain strength. In the future, it will not give up when strong pain arises while sitting in meditation for a long time. Thirteenth question. Man 2. Should we then simply know that the pain in our bones or fingers is dukkha? Answer. Only knowing that it is dukkha is not enough. You must contemplate it, examining it with wisdom until you completely understand it. For example, you should contemplate where the exact location of that dukkha is and why those who have died do not feel pain. The dead do not know anything. If you take a corpse and burn it, it does not feel the heat. Knowing that something is painful, what is that? Is it the jitta? When the body dies, does the jitta die as well? When you search for and find the basis of truth, such a tamma, you understand clearly because you truly know the heart that is freed from attachment. If the heart is still attached, you do not know truly. The more you want to be rid of dukkha, the more the dukkha and the origin of dukkha, samudaya, will increase in your heart. Instead of getting rid of the origin of dukkha, you succeed only in increasing it more than ever. Fourteenth question, Man 2. If we understand natural phenomena clearly and thoroughly, we will then see dukkha as natural, normal. Is that not right? Answer. Know dukkha. Know the nature of the body. Know that having a body is dukkha, and know that the body is its own dukkha. Know the nature of jitta, and knowing the jitta's natural state, know that the jitta by itself has no dukkha. Why does the jitta have dukkha at all? If you truly know all this, Zajatthamma will help to free you from dukkha. No amount of dukkha can affect the heart if both these aspects are truly known in their relationship to each other. Comment. 
I am very glad to hear that the pain and suffering which we get arises and passes away, and to learn how to train the jitta to get rid of them until freedom is reached. Answer. In practicing Thamma, each person has various experiences, and when we ask questions about these experiences and people hear about each other's experiences, we gradually widen our understanding. This encourages us and gives us all heart. Ajahn Mahabua then invited those present to sit in meditation. He himself sat in meditation for a time before returning to his quarters, leaving the lay people there each to sit in meditation as long as they liked.